So, or it is being recorded. And so um, if you're not comfortable with being on film, go ahead and, and turn your camera off. And if you wanna communicate through the, through the chat rather than by voice, you're welcome to do that too. But all right, well, hello everyone. Thanks for showing up. We have a, a very large audience, which is great. Um, if you're if you're um, if you just joined us, please mute your microphone. And uh, I want to officially welcome everyone to Reaching Out While Staying In, a library panel on community outreach, presented by the UALC Professional Development Committee. Um, again, thanks everyone for coming, and thanks to our panelists for being so gracious uh, to to volunteer for this. I'm Chris Yunkin. I'm the Learning Experience Librarian at Southern Utah University, and I'll be the host and moderator for this event. Um, so uh, today's program um, is going to be a great panel. We have different different people working in outreach from different uh, different institutions around Utah, and uh, so the program itself will be as follows: We're going to have our panelists each take about eight to ten minutes to share their experiences with uh, and their stories of outreach over the last year. And then um, as, as they're going through and, and, and sharing, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat or you can write it down and save it for, for a little bit later on. And then around 1.30 or a little bit after that, we're gonna open it up to questions. So I'll start um, with questions in the chat in the order that they uh, show up. And then uh, we should have plenty of time to answer everyone's questions and to discuss things. So um, let me introduce our panel. So on the panel today, we have Christopher Clark, who is the Engagement and Out Outreach Librarian at the Sherritt Library here at Southern Utah University. Um, we also have Jessica Green, who's a Writing Program Supervisor at the Harold B. Lee Library at Brigham Young University, and George Strawley, who is the um, NNLM, all of us community engagement coordinator from the uh, mid-continental region for the network of the National Library of Medicine at the University of Utah. So uh, that was a kind of a mouthful, but uh, we're really, really grateful to have all of you here. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone to our first uh, panelist, Christopher Clark. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, so welcome, everyone. I'm excited to chat with you today. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Christopher Clark. Uh, I'm the Engagement and Outreach Librarian here at SUU. Um, and Chris, can I just like, do, like point at you to like switch to the next slide when it happens? Is that okay? So I, I can't actually see you because I'm sharing my screen, but just say next slide. Oh, and go ahead and you know, what? next slide. It. I was trying to make it visual, but I'll, I'll you know, I'll point and say next slide. So next slide. Um, and today what I wanted to talk to you about are uh, mostly the event programming side of things um, in outreach. So I know that outreach covers a, a lot of different territories, including marketing, um, various forms of instructional outreach and so on. Um, but I wanted to focus mainly on event programming, uh, especially since that's an area that was uh, greatly impacted by COVID. Uh, and talk a little bit about my own experiences and try and fit in um, as many ideas that you can steal and co-opt and use um, just because when I go to uh, sessions, I tend to find that the most helpful. So I'll try and get in uh, a lot of those that you are uh, welcome to, to take and in, in use in your own libraries. Um, so if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, Chris. Um, and it's helpful to talk about what we were doing uh, in terms of library outreach programming in, in the before times, in the, in the long, long ago, um, before COVID was um, a, a thing we all had to deal with. Um, and we were doing a variety of different events. We had student orientations. Um, we had done a stage play in the library um, right before COVID hit, which was a ton of fun. Uh, we had readings from faculty. We did student open mics, uh, movie viewings, um, uh, what I like to call shindigs, uh, mostly because it's more fun to say than get togethers. Uh, we had a, a, a plethora of shindigs um, and we had tons of food. So this was always a big draw for um, programming is food, food, food. Uh, students are, are desperate for any kind of snack they can get. So anytime you had cookies or pizza, um, that was always a big draw. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, 2020 arrived um, and everything changed. So Chris, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and one of the things that we all had to deal with is, uh, is the reality of Zoom, Every, uh, everything or at least most things going digital. Um, and as my colleagues like to remind me, uh, one of the big benefits of, of the zoom averse we all inhabit now is um, our, our cats and pets. So this is our obligatory cat cameo number one from uh, Clem, aka Clem Chowder, um, who is, and I promise somewhere in the fractal geometry of fur, there is a cat in there. Um, so let's move on to the next slide, Chris. Um, and I want to talk about what what we need to think about when we're talking about exploiting the possibilities of, of the Zoomiverse, right? Um, and it it was it forced me to kind of reckon with how I was thinking about outreach, how I was thinking about programming, um, right? Um, and one thing is I obviously had to rethink format. Uh, the majority of our, our events were either fully in person or, or mostly in person. Um, so I had to completely rethink the format. Um, what are we going to do on Zoom? How are we going to make it engaging? How are we going to um, market it to, to students, right? Um, and one of the things I had to think about is um, in prior uh, event scheduling, I had uh, gone off mostly attended, attendance as, as a primary metric for, um, you know, the success of an event or not. Um, and, and then also like student surveys and things like that. Um, but I wanted to kind of refocus. So in, instead of attendance, because I knew that the numbers were going to take a dip um, in, in the Zoom, Zoomiverse, which they have, I, I wanted to try and rethink uh, how can I think of this less in terms of numbers of those attending and more how engaged and immersed um, students or um, you know viewers are in any given event. Uh, and also just focus on building relationships uh, across campus and beyond campus, right? Because one of the benefits of uh, using Zoom is it does open up your access to people in a way um, that we were much more limited uh, before in terms of, you know, who we can reach out to, who, who we can um, chat with and so on. Um, and I always wanted to keep in mind the rule of, of cool. Um, I, I wanted to try and where possible avoid anything that was going to feel too much like another class that students had to go to um, because they were, you know, stressed out and, and overburdened as it was uh, trying to transition um, into a completely Zoom classroom. So, so I wanted to really le lean into the rule of cool and try and make these as fun as possible. Uh, so next slide, Chris. Uh, and a lot of, a, a big way that we did this is we had um, a library present series, which was some interviews that we have done in, and that we are also in the process of continuing to do this semester, uh, where we just brought in cool people from outside of campus who do cool things and had an open discussion with them, invited people to ask questions. Um, we were able to get Paul Sutter, the astrophysicist, uh, Corey Doctorow um, was a big one. Uh, we got author Nathan Ballingrud, whose uh, Hulu, um, excuse me, whose story collection was just turn, turned into a Hulu uh, show um, uh, this last fall. Um, and so we got a ton of cool people here. And this is just a partial list. Um, and we, we were able to just basically reach out to a bunch of people. And of course, a ton of people said no, but a lot of people said yes. Um, and so, you know, in the fall, we spent grand total uh, um, about 500 bucks and we were able to get a lot of great speakers. Um, in wow. um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Chris. Uh, oh, this is a obligatory cat cameo number two. This is Puka, AKA Puka Bear. And we'll go to the next slide, Chris. All right, so in addition to the library present series, we wanted to try and rethink done before and put them in a new Zoom context. Um, so for instance, for our annual Halloween event, where we usually do like a, a, a horror reading and then we watch a horror film and so on for Halloween, um, we did that fully online and we used the public domain film Night of the Living Dead um, so we could stream it openly and not worry too much about copyright issues. Um, and we were also able to invite in readers. Uh, we got one from Providence, Rhode Island, um, uh, a horror writer from there, and also a horror writer from Dallas uh, to come and read for us in addition to the film. Uh, and we had one of our professors on campus who 
uh, teaches zombies and zombie uh, films to uh, chat with us about the movie. Um, we also just tried to do things that we'd done before, like poetry readings with faculty. This is a great way to just remind faculty that we're here and that we want them involved and engaged with what we're doing in the library. Right, so we invite them to share their work and to kind of engage with each other, um, you know, even if it is digitally. Uh, role playing games is a big one with with things like Roll20 and Discord. It's very easy to put together games and make them very interactive and engaging. Um, and then, of, of course, more. But uh, this is, again, a partial list. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, Chris. Obligatory uh, cat cameo number three. This is Sebastian, a.k.a. Sebadoodle. So hi, Sebastian. And we will move on to the next slide. And uh, these ideas are free, so help yourself to seconds. Uh, these are things that we have in mind, uh, uh, possibilities for the future in terms of how we best use this new format. Um, one is podcast, right? So podcast uh, could be something that's uh, uh, that that could reach students very easily. Uh, augmented reality instruction. Um, so for instance, you could do something um, totally ridiculous like a Call of Cthulhu campaign, where um, the whole premise and texture of that is that you have clues set up that you're doing research. So it lends itself well to kind of a, a fictionalized role-playing uh, delivery method for providing information literacy instruction. Uh, live streaming librarians. One of these days, I would like to live stream myself playing Phasmophobia so the students can hear their librarian um, scream himself silly. Um, digital collection so showcases, right, for those collections that are already digital. Um, sing alongs, um, the idea of adult story times, right? Most people, when they think of story times, uh, like that's a big part of when we're younger, our engagement with the library, especially the public library. So, uh, how can we bring that into the student space um, in a meaningful way through Zoom um, and so on? So, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, Chris. Um, this all kind of lends itself to asking the question of what can and what should we do differently, um, right? Because once we are able to, again, re-enter some kind of normalcy, uh, I, my hope is that we'll take some of these ideas and some of these ways that we've experimented um, and continue to build on them and use them in whatever comes after instead of um, simply retreating into what the old normal was um, so that we can kind of use these to, to build a, a, a best practices for um, event programming moving forward. Um, so without going over time, there's my information, my email address where you can uh, always reach out to me. I'm happy to share these slides. I'm happy to answer questions about any of the events and um, I'm always open to swapping ideas. Uh, so feel free to take what you can um, and uh, ask questions and I hope this was useful to you. Uh, and with that, I will pass on the relay race to the next speaker. Thank you. All right, thanks, Christopher. Um, our next presenter is Jessica Green. So go ahead. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, so my role at the Harold B. Lee Library at BYU is as the writing programs um, supervisor. So what that means is basically my role is really focused on instruction. Um, and particularly instruction of writing classes. So we have a little over 400 classes that come into, or now this year, zoom into the library for instruction each year. And I get to help coordinate, um, helping them find the right librarian, and then also some of the curriculum that we teach. So as I get going, I'm gonna go ahead and just drop links into the chat as I go along. So you can kind of explore um, some of the resources that I'm gonna mention. So um, in terms of instruction resources, um, when we moved online last year, one of the first things that we really discussed um, here at BYU is how can we beef up sort of the online um, tutorials that we already had existing. So a lot of people have online tutorials, but um, the ones that we had developed were being kind of underutilized. Um, we kind of recommended that faculty use them before they come in for library instruction. But when we moved online, um, we felt like it was really important to get more faculty buy-in on these. And so we created sort of a um, library assignment. Um, so you can kind of see that there, um, that we asked all of our beginning writing classes to do before they came into the library and push that a little harder. Um, the, the assignment sort of consists of, you can see the different modules that we have 
topic development, so brainstorming keywords, search strategies, so taking them through how to build a search, and also source evaluation. Um, and what we found as um, more classes have um, had stronger sort of engagement with our online tutorials is that we have to do a lot less demoing of databases. So some of the things um, that I didn't super love about instruction, the point and click um, instruction, I've actually been able to really move away from that in my instruction and focus more on active learning and small group consultations, which um, is the part that I like a little more. All right, next slide. Oh, so with this, um, one of the things that's been really helpful for me um, as they're completing this assignment, going through the videos and doing the activities, um, we built out um, a Qualtrics survey for them to submit a um, sample screenshot of the searches that they were doing, right? So they finish the homework and they send in these sample screenshots. And then we um, have a sort of shared folder for each instructor. And I can really briefly look through and find out what topics the students are researching for that class, as well as kind of how sophisticated are they in their searching? Are they using Boolean operators? Are they using um, different types of keywords? So I think this is something that is actually like a silver lining of COVID. This is something that I'm gonna continue um, moving forward for sure, because it just kind of helps me see where the classes are at um, when they come in for library instruction. Okay, next slide. Um, one of the other things um, that we had to change pretty rapidly when we went to online, drop this link in, um, was that we had been having all of our first year beginning classes come into the library for sort of a orientation experience. Um, and in the pre-COVID experience, the students would um, get together in a group in their classes and they would go out and find a book in the library. So they would learn to navigate sort of the the way that the library is organized, and then they would also interact with different help desks. So it was really helpful just to kind of give them a quick introduction to what the library has to offer. So once we moved online, we were trying to figure out how do we have that same experience happen in these classes that are all online. So our online learning team over the summer um, created this 360 virtual tour. Um, so they took um, 360 degree um, images of a couple of locations in the library and then made them explorable. Um, and so we picked um, particularly services. So the main help desk, which is still open, right? So where they can still get service. And then we also selected some services that had really strong offerings in terms of online appointments. So the research and writing center is one. And to make it more fun, um, our online learning group. So our uh, university mascot is Cosmo the Cougar. And you can kind of see in that left picture they put him throughout the uh, 360 um, images. So they, the students are looking for how many instances of Cosmo can they find? So that, that was like a fun way to um, offer, like um, to help encourage them to really look and explore the online uh, version of the library. Okay, next slide. Um, so with that, another part of my job is I work with the Research and Writing Center. So that is a collaboration between the library and the College of Humanity, um, College of Humanities. And so we offer the trained research consultants and then the College of Humanities does their own training for writing consultants. And prior to COVID, this was a huge service. Um, we did about 15,000 appointments a year. Um, but I would say 95, maybe even more percent of those were all in person. So once um, in person classes were canceled, we had to pretty rapidly pivot to offering way more online. So we had offered just a few appointments asynchronously. They would like send in their assignment and then we would give feedback. Um, we wanted to offer synchronous appointments, right? So like Zoom basically. And this was so clunky. Um, trying to transition any sort of in person service has a lot of problems, but um, this one was particularly difficult. Like we'd have people chat into the receptionist and then the receptionist would set up a Zoom link that then the consultant and the patron um, would have to, to navigate to. Um, and so one of the things that we really wanted to work on was just making that a lot easier for students. So next slide. We had used this scheduling software prior to COVID. It's, um, it's called WC Online, Writing Center Online. Um, but one of the things that we worked on over the summer was making it more Zoom friendly. And so um, now our current iteration um, with a lot of help from tech support is when a student makes an appointment, so reserves a spot on our calendar, 
um, we connect the Zoom link directly to their reservation. So both the consultant, like a research consultant or a writing consultant, and the student can both just click on that and they're automatically taken to um, their Zoom link. So I think one of the things that we learned through this was um, there is a high demand for online appointments, even though we'd almost exclusively done in-person appointments in the past. Um, to me, in the future, we'll definitely keep a really strong online appointment presence just because it's been so um, successful with students. All right, next slide. And then um, one other aspect of outreach that I wanted to mention was events. So Christopher talked a ton about um, awesome events. This is one that is directed to um, particularly new students. So we call it Secrets of the HBLL, the Harold B. Lee Library. Um, and it was this fun event that we had done for a couple fall semesters where we offered um, different services with sort of sponsor activities. So we did escape rooms is the Stranger Things picture at the top and we did um, sort of like online or not online, sorry, in-person like board games and stuff like that. Um, our humanities um, department did a really cool um, sticky note mural of Starry Night there, which is still up in our library, which is awesome. Um, so we just wanted to get students in the library, interacting with some of the services, doing fun things and just kind of learning about that. Um, we had 500 students attend last time we did it in 2019, and we just didn't want to lose that momentum, right, of getting students in this library. So on the next slide, um, we redesigned this event to go 100% online. So this was um, our landing page. It's in a couple of weeks, so we haven't held this event yet. Um, but we just designed this in LibCal. We wanted something that was really easy for us to um, update and change out things as um, different services wanted to do different activities. Um, the centerpiece is kind of always these games and escape rooms and things, but lots of different services within the library um, have volunteered to sort of sponsor events to make it really interactive. Um, and let me share that link for you guys. Um, and then next slide. So, and part of that was having a really fun um, sort of virtual escape room that we designed. So we used Captivate to design um, puzzle games, basically. So um, they are gonna come together as part of a team of students. Um, they can each sort of navigate on their own browser to the game, um, but they're gonna work together as a team to solve puzzles. So we have um, different sort of landscapes. In one, they're in a jungle and they're solving puzzles um, as they interact with each of these um, sort of animals. Um, and another, they're in a lab room and they're, um, I think they're trying to figure out like the chemical composition of something is the mystery they have to solve in that one. But this has been a really fun student project. We've been able to use lots of student expertise and kind of sprinkle little bits of library knowledge throughout um, to get the students to interact with the library website and really just to discover um, all the different great services that we have at our library. Okay, I think that's it for me. Um, I'll put my email in the chat if you guys have any questions directly for me. Thanks. Right, thanks, Jessica. So our, our last panelist, George, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, my name is George Drolley, and uh, if you can just jump to the next slide right away. Um, my job, uh, I, I'm with the, uh, the network of the National Library of Medicine, and uh, my job is a hybrid of a few different things. I, I work under a cooperative agreement uh, that the National Library of Medicine, uh, which is part of the NIH, uh, awarded to the University of Utah uh, in establishing our regional office of the network of the National Library of Medicine. And we are essentially the outreach arm of the National Library of Medicine. And uh, we we're based at health sciences libraries across the country. And I, I work with, with uh, different counterparts in, in other parts of the country as well. Um, we work with academic libraries, hospital libraries, and public libraries on providing staff training, uh, funding, especially uh, for community engagement by libraries, both academic and, and public. Uh, and also uh, we work on professional networking. Um, right now, I am working under an NIH supplement to our award that uh, supports an extensive project known as the All of Us Research Program. Uh, so actually, the library programs that I'm producing 
are being delivered by our member libraries. Uh, and you'll see how this comes into play a little bit later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, the all of this research program, uh, the overall mission is to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. Uh, it grew from uh, President Obama's uh, Precision Medicine Initiative in, uh, I think it was 2016. Uh, the, the program aims to build one of the largest, most diverse data sets of its kind for health research with 1 million or more volunteers nationwide who will sign up to share their information over time. And my job is to support that program by aiding libraries in reaching diverse communities with reliable health information. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Pre-COVID, we envisioned that mission as a task of getting libraries and community organizations together to do an in-person program. Uh, one typical project involves sending kits of books on health topics uh, to libraries of use by their book discussion groups. Uh, each kit was a ready-made program in a box and these were being sent to, to public libraries, also a few academic libraries as well. Uh, and, and this program in a box would contain, uh, also contain discussion questions and resource materials uh, and we called it the NNLM Reading Club. Um, here you see my project coordinator, Sam. Uh, she's showing a, a supply of books uh, that we would ship out, uh, mostly to public libraries uh, that, in that bag. There'd be eight books in that bag. Uh, the other photo shows what was contained in a typical kit. Uh, you would have the eight books, plus uh, some magazines, uh, some informational materials, and then a tote bag for each of the uh, for each book club member to have, have a, a bag to take home, uh, and then uh, a, one big giant bag for the, uh, uh, for the whole kit to be uh, uh, put in and it could be checked out uh, to patrons. Um, COVID forced us to stop sending out the kit for two reasons. Uh, first, our funders became concerned about the risk of transmitting COVID through face-to-face -face programs. Uh, secondly, nearly every library in the country arrived at about the same concern and shut down for varying lengths of time. Um, so if they did reopen after a few weeks, they did so without any face-to-face -face program. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, uh, we needed to focus on helping libraries engage their audiences in a virtual envi environment. Uh, we already had a website set up in support of the Reading Club uh, that included uh, digital copies of many of the resources we supplied in the physical kits. Uh, we decided to continue with that, even though we were no longer able to send out the physical books. Um, and, and this is an example of, of uh, three selections that we have uh, in the month of March. Um, uh, th this would be the typical setup. We would have uh, the three books and, and, uh, and then the website uh, providing information on the books. Um, our first attempt at a, at a pivot was to talk with uh, online vendors, uh, particularly Overdrive, about possibly purchasing um, kits, uh, essentially kits of electronic book licenses or providing some sort of resource with uh, uh, health ebooks to uh, participating libraries. Um, what we found was that there was a lot, there were a lot of barriers to making something like that happen. Uh, first, uh, the titles we were interested in had to be in Overdrive. We, we, we focused on Overdrive because it was the most common uh, ebook vendor for, for public libraries. And a lot of the titles were not in Overdrive. Um, and secondly, uh, library business offices were not set up in a way that we could purchase individual ebook titles on their behalf or reimburse them for individual titles. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, the ebook vendors we're just not that interested in, in this tiny bit of business that we could provide them. Uh, it was a lot of work for them and, and not much gain for them. Um, next slide, please. So we turned to something we could do online, which was uh, virtual author talks. Um, we, we got in touch with several of the authors whose books we had featured in the preceding months and started to invite them to give a brief, brief author talk uh, followed by a Q&A session uh, in a total one hour program. Um, this talk was done by Bill Sullivan, uh, an Indiana University faculty member who wrote a book called uh, Please to Meet Me, Genes, Germs, and the Curious Forces That Make Us Who We Are. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, we also had uh, Danny McLean, uh, a contributing writer to the nation and author of We Live for the We, The Political Power of Black Motherhood. Uh, this one was done in conjunction with a, a community-based organization known as the Black Women's Health Imperative. Uh, and one important thing for our organization was that wherever possible, we try to find community organizations or health organizations interested in partnering with us. Uh, it it uh, furthers the reach of the program that way in, in engaging the community. Uh, next slide. And here's one that we have uh, coming up next month uh, featuring Amy Byer Shaneman, author of uh, Resurrection Lily, The BRCA Gene, Hereditary Cancer, and Life Saving Whispers from the Grandmother I Never Knew. Uh, in this one, the author asked to be teamed up with a, uh, a certified genetic counselor whom she knew. Uh, and they're, they're going to be presenting this, this program together. Um, next slide. We started out uh, by doing our talks purely in Zoom, uh, but soon started running our programs on a combination of YouTube and Facebook Live. Uh, the advantage of doing it this way was that we were working with uh, more and more partner libraries and organizations as this, this program uh, picked up steam. Uh, these organizations could run the Zoom-based event on their Facebook pages. Uh, and then we could also have uh, the YouTube feed as a separate way of accessing the program uh, while also keeping the YouTube recording so that uh, uh, people who uh, discovered the talk later could, could view it. Um, as the programs drew more partner interest and got more sophisticated, uh, we were fortunate uh, because we were a, a fairly big project with, with, with a lot of uh, libraries participating. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to hire a production company affiliated with the University of Washington. Um, they added a program called vMix uh, that allowed them to bring a higher production value to the program with the split screens and, and the lower third graphics with the names at the bottom uh, that you see here. However, I, I, I do want to say a lot uh, can be accomplished by running uh, just a talk in Zoom. That's how we did it originally as we started this program uh, back in the summer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we used uh, PowerPoint slides to provide the viewers with housekeeping information, uh, like instructions on how to get closed captioning. Um, we also used slides to provide information about our funders program, information about the Reading Club, uh, and introductory materials on their speakers. Next slide. Uh, a number of people, um, we had a fairly decent sized team, a number of people served in, in certain defined roles that developed over time. Uh, we have a speaker, speaker liaison who invites the speaker and takes care of all the liaison work with him or her. Uh, we also needed a partner liaison to help with the increasing number of partners we had. Uh, there was an event host who opened and closed the program and introduced the speaker. Uh, there was a moderator who, uh, is actually one of the speakers who kind of uh, worked with the, the, the featured author. Um, uh, there's timekeeper, chat moderator, um, who would feed audience questions to the speakers. And we used a, uh, a Google Doc uh, to set up, uh, the, set up the questions for the, for the speakers so that they could see them uh, in the chat rather than having to uh, uh, search through the chat window to, to figure out where the questions were with all the traffic going on in the, in the, in the chat window. Um, and as the program grew more complex, we actually had multiple people who would monitor the various Facebook feeds for questions and then copy and paste the questions over to the Google Doc. Um, we had tech support and production, as I mentioned, um, and we recently found something called, we, we recently came up with something called a link jockey uh, who would add uh, useful resources to the chat conversation uh, and, and help enhance the program. Something like, oh, you know, this speaker mentioned breast cancer. Here is some information on breast cancer at this link, so, something like that. Um, and we also had a graphic artist and evaluator because everything has to be evaluated. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some things that we learned as we went, went along, um, we developed a planning process and found it invaluable for, for a complex project like this. Um, but I think it would be critical even for something on a smaller scale. Um, 
I suggest having a meeting a few days beforehand so that the participants can ask questions and try out ideas. Um, get everybody to arrive early. Um, because we had a production company involved, we actually had people log on a uh, full 90 minutes before the program so that the production team had plenty of time to work out any technical bugs. And then most people were then, you know, most of the, the presenters were then able to take a break before the program began uh, and, and just leave Zoom up and running. Um, also, I recommend giving the speakers room to do their talk in their way. Um, we had one person do a basic Q&A, uh, another person uh, presented slides, and a, a third uh, brought in a co-presenter, as I mentioned uh, uh, previously. Um, expect the partners to have issues with things such as setting up the live feed. Um, that's why the liaison is, is very important, having, having a liaison if you're going to use partners. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, remember to thank people. Um, next slide, please. And this is an example of our, uh, our thank you slide for one program. You just put the logos up there. Uh, people are, are very happy if they get their logo for their organization uh, up on, on screen uh, for, for uh, a decent sized audience. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, we are now expanding into some different uh, types of, of programs. I, I, I didn't talk too much on this because um, uh, it's still a work in progress, but uh, we're doing uh, film screenings and discussions. And we will be presenting five screenings of a documentary called Life Interrupted, Telling Breast Cancer Stories. Uh, it's an intimate look at the experiences of three women from different backgrounds who all faced breast cancer. And we have that coming up in March and April. Uh, and I'd like to encourage you to sign up for the, the free film screening if you'd like. And I'm going to put the, uh, the, uh, the sign up uh, link in the chat in a moment here. And uh, next slide. And I just wanna say thank you uh, for attending and listening. And there's a lot more we'll, we'll be able to say about this process when we finish out our current round of programs by the end of April. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions. I'll pass it back to you, Chris. All right, thanks. Give me a moment to stop sharing my screen and get back into uh, full screen on this here. All right, thank you, that was great. So um, I, I wanna open up as, uh, and leave as much time as I can for answering questions. There are a few questions in the chat so um, if you do have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. If you want to ask a question, go ahead and use the raise hand function. Um, and I'll try to make sure I keep track of everyone who's raising their hand and um, calling on them accordingly. So we do have uh, one question in the chat here um, from Kim. Uh, do you, meaning the presenters, uh, think that attending virtual, uh, uh, sorry, let me reread that. <laughs> Do you think that attending events virtually will be the expectation of participants even after we are able to meet in person? Um, our virtual platform's here to stay. So I'll open that up to any of, of you three that want to answer that question. That's a good question. I'm, I'm thinking that just off the top of my head, I'm thinking that people might want to have the option of attending virtually. I think uh, we might see more hybrid programs uh, if, if libraries are willing to, to go that direction. What about you, Christopher, Jessica? Yeah, I, I would echo what George said. I, I do think there's probably uh, uh, gonna be the, um, kind of a renewed interest in hybrid programs so at least having the capability to attend things online um, but but that said my my instinct is that um, most people are going to be desperate to be in the company of other people and will will really look forward to having uh, events in person again um, but I, I do think um, having those that the possibility for hybrid events will be very important especially for um, you know those you know, students who are maybe immunocompromised and et, et cetera, um, as we slowly crawl back towards normalcy. 
Yeah, I agree. I think something like George's program um, that's nationwide, that totally makes sense to me. I would attend that virtually. Um, I think for uh, events that are just for your campus community, I agree with Christopher. I definitely think there's going to be a big push to move a lot of things back online, or sorry, back in person. All right, thank you. So we have uh, another question here from Kimberly. Um, how many people are attending your virtual events? So I, I would say it, it we had them in the Sorry, I should probably be a better moderator. So why don't we start with George and then go to Christopher and then Jessica, because that's just the order you're in on my screen. Uh, we, we've had any number of them. I mean, we've had some that, that you know, only get, uh, even with a national program, only get four or five. Attendees, and then we've we've gotten, you know, it is it is very, you know, actually as to what the what the gets the interest. I think I think it, it was that way before COVID too. All right, thanks, Christopher. Oh yeah, I, I mean, pretty much the same. It, it just kind of depends on the event. Um, you know, some there's only you know just a, a small handful. Um, the good thing about things that you can record and post afterwards is um, I, I will count uh, views as, as attendance after the pack. So that's, uh, that's helpful in kind of uh, getting numbers for that. All right, thanks, Jessica. Do you have an answer to this? No, not really. Because uh, our first like big campus-wide event that I've been in charge of is this one that we're having in a couple weeks. But we kind of have talked about like, what's our target number? Um, cause the last time we did it in person, we had this big number of people come and I think, you know, it's just scalability, right? You just understand, um, we may get a few, we may get a lot. It's hard to say. You just have to make sure that your event makes sense in both of those contexts. All right. Thanks. So we have a, we have a comment from Matt, um, says, I think the hybrid conferences meetings really open up opportunities for international participation. Um, which, uh, yeah, definitely, I think having that. And uh, I'll just quickly insert um, a little anecdote. I did uh, present at a hybrid conference and there were about 10 people there in person and about a hundred people there virtually. And it was very strange, <laughs> but, uh, but I think we're all kind of getting used to it. And I think it does open up a lot of opportunities. Okay, so uh, Marissa asks, Oh, or this is a comment. Um, we did an in-person family history classes at the BYU library and had a few participants for each session around 10 or even fewer. And now we do virtual family history classes. We generally have a hundred each time or over a hundred each time. So yeah, definitely I can see that. Um, Emily asks, um, how are you marketing the events to students? Have attendees said how they learn about the event? Or I guess we, not just students, but it, it, I guess any any participants. So how are you marketing these? So again, let's go George, then Christopher, then Jessica. Well, considering I mean some of our things were were community focused. Uh, so the the partners we we let the partners do a lot of the work for us on 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 those things um, because uh, they they've already got the connections in place um, and and. They have the audience that, that we want to reach, uh, so relying on the partners with with uh, with their especially their social media um, and and things like that has been very helpful for us. Yeah, and I, I think word of mouth is super important because um, we we do the usual things that that most libraries will do with. You know, social media. We have a student portal where, you know, when students log in, um, uh, where we can kind of advertise things on that portal. Um, but I, I think I think the biggest thing is still word of mouth, especially when you are marketing towards students, um, because students I, I think are part of a generation, and and I think even millennials like myself fall into this category where traditional marketing doesn't really work. 
um, in, the, in the way it used to. Um, we're very, very good at filtering it out. Um, and so I, I think the best way is to have, you know, a friend or a community member or somebody you know that's telling you something uh, about something cool coming up that tends to be the most effective. Uh, and I think you see that with our, our yearly Halloween event because we've been able to track like the numbers and it's just really blown up over the years because people are able to spread the word and like, oh, you need to go to this this year and, and that sort of thing. So, so I can't, um, yeah, I, I can't understate how important that word of mouth is. Yeah, so most of our advertising, I feel like, is done through, I mean, we have traditional channels, um, like Christopher mentioned, but campus partner partnerships. So we have the Office of First Year Experience um, that has been a great partner with us, and also um, just folks that I know in, like, residence life, for example. Um, the one, like, silver lining I would say about advertising this year is that there's so many fewer events going on across campus that it kind of stands out. Um, so we've gotten into some like newsletters and emails that traditionally we've never been able to get into just because there's not that much going on this year. So that's been that's been kind of cool to see. Yeah, so so I, I have a question and I'm kind of curious because I'm an instruction librarian and so that's that's my main focus. Um, but I'm kind of curious with uh, one of the things that that have, has been happening with sort of this transition to doing things um, kind of more in a hybrid way or all online as far as teaching classes. Um, it's kind of hard, you know, like as, as the person presenting, and I guess I've experienced this too with conference presentations that are online, it's a very different experience delivering um, programming to you know, as in with this context, uh, you know, sort of a Brady Bunch, um, Hollywood Squares kind of stack of uh, black boxes with names, and it's a very different dynamic. Um, and so as far as kind of gauging if, if the people who are attending are engaged or not, I know, Christopher, you mentioned a little bit more about kind of looking at engagement rather than, um, than attendance. Um, what are some strategy strategies that you've used to um, keep the audience engaged? And then it, has there been a way for you to tell if it's working or not? I can answer that more from like an instructive perspective. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I've done is I really count on like whiteboarding software. So I use like Miro, Padlet, there's tons of them, right? Um, but instead of waiting, like I don't, I hardly ever pose questions to the class necessarily. I always put some, a question up and then let them put sticky notes and things like that on there. Um, and then I start a discussion from there. I can say, oh, okay, someone had a really interesting perspective. Let's, let's let that person talk more. Um, just because, yeah, it used to be you could just kind of wait and there was a silence and someone would answer if you posed a question um, on Zoom. Yeah, you can't count on that. Yeah, I, I would just echo that, just making things as, as interactive um, as you can um, and uh, trying to, um, because it, it sometimes becomes too, too passive and you feel too much like you're just kind of um, watching something happen in the background instead of being involved in it, it can be very easy to tune out. Um, and uh, and I think and I think that's true of you know whether you're talking about uh, Jessica mentioned instruction, you know, or you know events and so on. So so even having something like this with the Q and A where the audience can uh, interact more directly, I think just uh, whatever you can do, I think is important to get that interactivity. And we use uh, polling and, uh, you know, that, that's often a, a very helpful thing. And uh, um, like, like, uh, like you said, the, uh, the, the question and answering, question and answer interaction just helps a lot. All right, we have a comment um, from Emily. It says, uh, we use Teams at UVU and sometimes I can only see one person at a time if I'm sharing my screen to present. Uh, it's tricky for sure. And I, I know that I've experienced, I, I literally just experienced that a few minutes ago when I was presenting the slides. Um, 
So, uh, so Linda says, as a participant, I enjoy doing polls and seeing results from other participants. Um, I've never used polls actually, but uh, that does sound interesting. Um, so uh, that we don't have any other questions in the um, in the chat. So if you if you have a question that you want answered, go ahead and throw it in there now. Um, we have about eight minutes left, so I, I wanted to uh, open it up for the the panelists. If there's anything that you you didn't say that you want to say at this point, um, or any or any comments or any other advice, go ahead. Just because I can see her next to me on screen, Linda has her hand raised, so I think. She oh, I see that. Yeah, so my, the boxes are all flipping around. Yes, Linda. I, I meant to unmute it and I put it in there. Does Zoom even do polls? I don't know if it does or not. Zoom webinar does. Um, you can, if you use the webinar version of, of Zoom, you, you can get polls in there. Unfortunately, you give up other things. You, you, you give up the meeting uh, back and forth. Um, you know the the ability of people to 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 participate like it's a meeting rather than a, than a webinar. But but Zoom Zoom webinar does let you do the polls. Okay. Since all of you are um, in the Utah Academic Library Consortium group, by a show of hands, who is going? To, no, I don't really want you to raise your hands. But I'm assuming some of you will be doing presentations at the virtual ULA conference coming up. And I think there was a meeting today about that, probably. I don't know if there was or not. I missed it. What format are they using? This is Matt's icky camera. That's why you can't hear me, Christopher. <laughs> Do you know what format they're using? Will, be, will we be able to use polls if we're um, presenting in that? Because you know I'm only familiar with a very few things. I'm kind of scared about it, quite frankly. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer to that. I, um, yeah, so if anyone, anyone in the audience knows about the ULA and the, the virtual format, it looks like um, a few people have commented that you can do polls in a regular Zoom style meeting. Um, you just have to set it up before the meeting um, and stay as the host. So that's, um, Jessica said that. Yeah. Yeah. So Matt says thanks to me and the panelists. So, um, yeah. So, so in the last final moments, George, Christopher, or Jessica, any final parting words of wisdom? Uh, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, yeah, you can do it in the meeting. That, that I had forgotten about that. Um, and. Uh, of, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about this today. I, I'm looking forward to uh, what we're going to be doing um, with uh, different types of programs, um, especially the film screenings, screenings that we're going to be doing. Uh, so I might have some more to tell you about that later. And uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the insights I've gotten into, uh, uh, into instructional work. Thanks, Christopher, Jessica. I I don't know that I have anything particularly wise to say other than um, please reach out if you have questions. I'm always um, I'm always happy to network and and answer questions and share ideas. Um, I, I love doing that. Um, and otherwise, just hang in there and keep hope alive, as my old professor used to always in class with. Yeah, I'll echo Christopher. I think um, when you're the person doing outreach or events, you know, this year it's just been an anomaly. Um, I think whatever we can do to continue reaching out is, is going to be good and to focus less on the numbers and more on um, the outcome um, and the opportunity that you have to reach people. So thanks. All right. Thank you. So there. Um, so Linda and anyone else who is curious about um, the ULA format looks like there's a few comments in the chat that are explaining that. We have some thank yous um, to the panelists and um, thanks everyone for coming. I'm gonna stop the recording and just wait for people to trickle out. <laughs> <laughs>